Welcome back to the book club for Probabilistic Machine Learning, the textbook by Dr. Kevin Murphy. Last time we talked about the first half of the chapter on logistic regression and some of the mathematical ideas thereof. As you can see on the screen in front of us, what we're going to talk about today includes some of the techniques such as robust logistic regression, Bayesian logistic regression, and a probit approximation. To recall some of the notations, remember that we use logistic regression for classification task, where our labels are equivalent to having something like zero or one. And that means that we have a Bernoulli distribution where the log odds are logit and that's plugged into the sigmoid function that we've seen before. So what I thought we'd do today is look at these techniques and I, out of my own um, biases, I uh, did this in the R programming language. Oh, yeah. Wait. Hi, Derek, by the way. <laughs> Once again, I thought we would go with the ubiquitous Palmer Penguins example for the classification. I'm simply asking our uh, algorithms to classify the chin strap penguins. Overall, the data set has 333 observations, just to make a note for later. To perform logistic regression in R, one way to do that is to use the generalized linear models function from the stats package, which usually comes installed when you install the R programming language or R studio in general. So thus in this picture, what I have graphed is a decision boundary kind of akin to what we studied in previous chapters, where at the moment I'm classifying the dots above the decision boundary as possibly chin strap penguins and the gray dots below the decision boundaries as other. Note that this picture and the previous picture are slightly different. In particular, before I forget, the decision boundary is when the logit A is equal to zero, the E to the negative A part. So when when that part, when that exponent is equal to zero. When you do classifications like this, I found that these pair of functions from the janitor package are useful for quickly counting up the notions such as true positives, true negatives, and so forth. And as you can see at the, on the bottom of the screen, went ahead and calculated that for this simple example, the accuracy is about 96%. So now where the textbook leads us is into a notion called robust logistic regression. Folks who have taught a statistics class or taken a statistics class realize that we teachers use the word robust when we talk about why we want people to report a median in addition to a mean so that we, we could be robust against outliers possibly uh, affecting our calculations. And yeah. same deal here. We want to um, be concerned about the misclassified outliers and that might greatly affect where the modeling um, ends up. So as mentioned last time, part of the idea is kind of a penalization. We want an upper bound on the regression coefficients. So the first idea that's just kind of mentioned by the textbook author really quickly is to make a linear combination 
of an uninformative prior, that's this uh, first term here, and the logistic regression, that's this term here. So we have a linear combination, presumably that the pi values go between zero and one. This part, Bernoulli distribution was a 0 0.50 um, population prior is akin to simply a coin flip. And then you have the more complicated logistic regression. And the theme of this is to do what the textbook author is calling tempering, kind of reducing um, the role that the other term will play in the calculations. Mm. Now, if that seemed like hand wavy magic, it's, it's kind of, it is. <laughs> it kind of is. <laughs> so instead, what the textbook guides us into is a much more rigorous notion, and I want to try to represent that here. So looking back at the classification that I grabbed before, we have our decision boundary there in orange, and we're going to look at at first what I'm what is called far misclassifications in in this one where the green arrow is pointing. We have a purple dot that is arguably far away from the decision boundary, and it might affect the calculations. Uh, skipping ahead in the mathematical rigor a bit, if we jump to cases where we have one hot encoding and we look at the categorical variable and focus on the individual labels, we have a notion called the tempered cross entropy loss. That is, earlier in the textbook, we would have equations such as a logarithmic transformation or cross entropy to measure some of the ideas going on in the background. Yeah. What these versions of the formulas do is actually provide that upper bound on some of the numbers that we achieve. So in this formula, just really quickly, this so-called T sub one is a number between zero and one. It, just mathematically or arithmetically cannot be one itself because of the way the fraction set up. But just in case you're curious about it, as we take T1 to approach 1.0, this part reverts back to a logarithm formula. And this part reverts back to the previous version of cross entropy that you would have encountered in the textbook. And thus this formula, the tempered cross entropy loss is a generalization of what we've seen before. Okay. So then from there, I believe the notions that when you have some of these constructions, especially when you have a bunch of differences, subtractions going on, this would be a good idea for far misclassifications. But if you have something near the decision boundary, such as what I have here in this picture, then it, that previous formula might not work out so well. So once again, I'm thinking of a close misclassification as a mislabeled observation or dot, such as where the green arrow is pointing. Yeah. In this case, skipping ahead in some of the mathematical formulation, the the value for the um, classification, the probability perhaps, uh, ends up with a, admittedly a fairly complicated formula. Uh, T sub two is greater than one in this case. But in particular, what I liked about uh, where this ends up is noting that if we're talking about the probability that an observation is for a particular class in the categorical variable, remember that 
in situations where you know all the classes, you know all the possible labels out there, well, then the, those probabilities have to add up to, to 100%. And when this all comes together, it turns out that this formulation has, has this um, parameter in it. And in this formulation, this parameter can be solved with a fixed point algorithm, where if you've taken a numerical analysis class on route to study and applied mathematics, uh, the fixed point iteration is a pretty standard algorithm. And you could refer to algorithm 10.2 in the in the textbook if if you're curious. To the best of my knowledge, the way to do this in R is that there are uh, researchers who are working on a additional set of functions that handle these notions of we robust regressions. Remember, yeah. we're trying to be ro robust against outliers. And they have a robust version of their generalized linear model. The rest of the code otherwise is the same. Admittedly, at this point, because I had set up such a simple example, um, most of the rest of this calculation is the same as the previous one. It's really subtle. This line is very slightly different than the previous one. But when I run the analysis on the categorical variable, I get the exact same um, counts here. Right. Um, how are we doing, folks? Any questions on the idea so far? I, um, to be honest, I didn't quite follow the um precisely why one version of robust regression was more appropriate for outliers that are far from the decision boundary than um the near um it's um is there the the does the does the 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 nat whether it's specific or sensitive matter in terms of what robust approach you might use as well if it's like more prone to misclassifying one class than the other does that influence what algorithm you'd use yeah i agree with you uh, maybe if it was more apparent where the logistic regression comes in then we could get a sense of where the distance from the decision boundary is yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay cool but it's um yeah no i i don't have any um i don't have any questions that i have uh any insight into i'm <laughs> afraid um yeah. Okay. For the the next third of this session, I admit I took my own liberties because I found that the textbook produced some nice images, but they were really maybe too straightforward. Like you kind of drew lines where you wanted them to be. Yeah. So I'm going to try um running these ideas directly on the penguins example and see how that goes. But uh talk about the background first. We are looking at a notion called Bayesian logistic regression. It's in my opinion, and I'm pretty biased on these matters, uh growing in popularity. It's just that over the past 10 years or so, uh folks have finally made this computationally feasible for um for novice pro um, programmers. The idea is that compared to the images I showed you in the previous slides, where we could have one decision boundary, essentially a particular slope and a particular inter intercept, 
where we could get those values as point estimates. In the Bayesian world, we might want to use your uncertainty, get a sense of variance and standard deviation. The issue is that when you talk about posterior distributions, you recall from your probability course, this is thought of as integrals. And when you get to fairly complicated situations, the notion of actually taking the integral becomes uh, quite computationally complex as well. We could uh, work with the arguably the best fit line, which would be at the maximum likelihood estimate actually, and then skipping ahead in the story a bit, maximum a uh, posterior estimates. But nevertheless, uh, computing, so we're kind of working off that instead of computing the integral. A nice thing to also consider about Bayesian techniques is if you're in a situation where you have a relatively small data set, uh, the Bayesian, it's in just loosely speaking, does a good job of kind of leveraging uh, data versus each, each other. And you might be able to get some decent results with a smaller data set. Now, some of the ideas, nevertheless, towards Bayesian logistic regression have existed for several decades. And one of them is credited back to the plus. We could think about for a unique solution, we can employ a spherical Gaussian prior. Now, as uh, you all mentioned last week, the idea is if your uh, loosely speaking feasible region is positive definite, you could kind of think of this as a multidimensional parabola. And when you're doing later, when you're doing optimizations on that parabola, you hope that your algorithm converges. And fortunately, if it does converge, there'll be one minimum point. So with the spherical Gaussian, I think it falls in that realm where it's saying that the coefficients are normally distributed, which we'll is give this a mean of zero and a standard deviation of, that's the same across all the variables. Now, for this variance here, if we have a small variance, that is, we kind of have an idea of where the number should be in the Bayesian part answer, that would be an informative prior. And then like on the contrary, if we have a large variance, we would call that a vague prior. Now the informative prior would be better for sensitivity matters and a vague prior would be better for specificity. So just whichever uh, type of error you were more worried about. The Bayesian matters in general, uh, to the best of my knowledge, are handled by Markov chain Monte Carlo. And I'll walk us through a calculation here. One of the current ways to do MCMC is to run the generalized linear models function using the STAN engine. For our, for us, our programmers, we use the R STAN ARM package, uh, ARM standing for applied regression models. And this is a wrapper that allows us to access the STAN engine using relatively simple code. Now, I wanted to have a good sense of the prior distribution of the decision boundary, which uh, for this particular calculation, for this particular very simple example was not necessary. I just wanted to try this out. So the way I defined the prior distribution was I actually grabbed the quote unquote best fit line from a, a quick ordinary d squares on the whole data set and then plugged in the numbers here. Admittedly, it didn't actually change the calculations too much, but at least I feel it's an educated guess. The internals 
for MCMC. I produce four chains. Let this run for a chain length of of ten thousand, keeping the second half, the second group of five thousand. And before I forget, a lot of this code I got from the base rules textbook. Now, uh, for the images that I'm going to show you, what I did was I actually modeled the prior distribution first and then quickly made the posterior distribution by uh, plugging the prior into the update function. Now, when we run MCMC, this could be a calculation that does take a while. On my computer, which I think is a pretty decent computer, this calculation took about 40 seconds. And that's on a data set, uh, we call, of a, of a sample size of 333. When you get data sets in the thousands or especially in the 10,000s and so forth, these calculations can take a, a quite a long time. I imagine this is at the point where some data scientists just let the calculation run overnight. I just want to point out uh, for our data science learning community book clubs and the GitHub host, it, this actually ran twice as fast as it did on my computer, which I was very surprised by. Okay, so conceptually, uh, admittedly this picture is ugly for several reasons, but what I wanted to just simply get across was that the prior distribution is trying to I'm just trying to make a guess at where the decision boundary is, but with a rather vague prior, you could see that line could be pretty much anywhere, really. But at least I have an educated guess that the line goes through the centroid. In reality, these lines could have a bunch of different slopes and a bunch of different intercepts, just for the sake of the picture. I took some liberties, and if you're really curious, I um, disclosed the R code as well. Then what the Markov chain Monte Carlo methods will do is essentially bounce around in the spaces for the coefficients that we're trying to achieve, the intercept, uh, the footprint length, and the build length, um, predictor variables. The, these pictures are admittedly very crowded, but it's essentially just a very uh, volatile line graph that's bouncing back and forth. But what you're hoping for with your MCMC chains is that otherwise your the numbers that you're achieving kind of stay in the same region, kind of have their own bell curve, so to speak. So then what happens is that once you run these chains, run these calculations, then your posterior distribution essentially does a good job of focusing on where uh, your results uh, could be. So in this case, once again, I'm trying to take the data, classify it via a decision boundary. Now, in this picture, I have I believe 20 decision boundaries, which yes, is much more complicated than the techniques I showed in the first half of this session. But the idea is that we could get a sense of how much do these thoughts vary. When you have a posterior distribution coming from a Bayesian process like this, one useful thing to do is to grab the coefficients and run them through the tidy function from the Bloom mix package. And what that will do is uh, get your point estimates like usual. So you have your intercept, you have your, your slopes going in those directions. But also in this case, I prescribed a 90% confidence interval for each coefficient. So that way we could get a sense of that uncertainty. Grossly speaking, what we could do with these confidence intervals is double check if the value of zero is within those intervals or not. 
and to get a sense if that plays a role. Since the number zero is not in these credible in these intervals, I could say that at least for this model, flipper length does seem to play a role in the classification of the penguins. And likewise, bill lengths uh, seems to play a role. That is to say, since zero is not in these intervals, we seem to have some evidence that these variables do matter. And another way to look at that uncertainty is to use the MCMC areas function from another helper package called a base plot package. So here, the point estimates are graphed in the dark blue vertical lines, and those 90% credible intervals are expressed in the shaded regions. And that's Bayesian logistic regression. Are there any hmm. further thoughts for so, the discussion on this? When you're actually um, using Bayesian logistic regression for prediction, um, do you do you need to keep all your kind of posterior samples of the weights and things in order to do that on say an a, a newly um introduced data set? So I should notice, consider I just <laughs> taught a whole semester of this. <laughs> uh, a uh, part of it is when we're making a prediction, I just found that we usually predict on a particular uh, penguin. I think I still have the image here, actually. When we do a prediction on, on this, we would have a particular penguin, say, if we have a particular footprint length and a particular build length. Yeah. And then we could uh, try to do the classification from there. Uh, yes, we we could get a posterior predictive interval for the probability that it would that the penguin would be a chin strap. Okay, right. right. Yeah. But I forget if you would uh, if it saves computation elsewhere, because the way that the R packages are set up, um, when you do the posterior predictive checks and so forth, it might rerun the whole entire MCMC oh, okay. simulation. So you would favor Bayesian logistic regression over um, the robust regression methods? Is it, or or, or is, in, in some way, is there a a kind of um similarity between the two because you that introducing the priors d does in some way kind of um penalize the 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 possibility of having large coefficients um in the same way that robust regression does is that right? I, I appreciate they're quite different methods, but yes, I su suppose I don't think we have any assurance that no. this would uh, okay. hone or penalize the regression coefficients, and in some sense, we might not even have assurance that the MCMC would converge either. Right, right. But yes, yeah, so. Depending on your situation, on um, what analysis you're running, um, which team you're working with, which which clients you're working with, you would have this trade off that, of course, you would have this calculation that just off the top of my head takes ten thousand times as long <laughs> as other calculations. Uh, but in this case, you would then get the ability to measure the the variance of the coefficients and the uncertainty thereof, and yeah, if that's yeah. what your team values, then that's what you would need to do.
So then noting all all that, so like I kind of offhand mentioned before, some of these Bayesian calculations could take several hours if if you were running this on a serious data set. And one thing to consider that folks have considered in in the past um maybe few decades is the probation to avoid long computation times. And that is to avoid the notion of approximating that posterior distribution that integral in the first place. As a side note, uh, reading through this chapter, I don't know if the textbook author noted this earlier in, in the book. I, I just simply asked my chatbot AI friend, hey, what does probit mean? And it said, oh, it's a portmanteau for probability unit. So this is probability unit. Okay. So the thought process is in the Bayesian mindset, we're going to assume that the likelihood is also normally distributed, that the coefficients also have some sort of mean, some um, co covariance matrix to describe them in between. And this kind of lends itself towards the normal, normal conjugate pair um, family that you would find in Bayesian studies. In particular, uh, if you remember just what the functions look like, I probably should have graphed this. The sigmoid function kind of has a similar S shape to the cumulative density function for a, a normal distribution. And what folks did was rescale the inputs to the CDF by the square root of pi over eight, so that at the point of inflection, these two functions were at least have the same slope, the same rate of change there. And if we just continue that train of thought through some more equation work, the posterior distribution in this context, the probability of classifying a penguin as chin strap could now be done by plugging in some numbers directly into the sigmoid function, where in this notation, m is the expected value of the logit and v is the variance of the logit. And what the textbook author notes is that what this does is it produces estimates that are closer to the decision boundary than what logistic regression would have done otherwise. In my search for materials, I wanted to also try to do this in the R programming language, but I'm not as sure if this was the correct way to do it. We could once again invoke the generalized linear models function from the stats package in base R. The change in the code comes all the way down here, where we say that the functional uh, link in, in the formulations is now the probit, the probability unit, rather than say, make a logarithmic transformation. I, for the sake of making these slides in this book club, I let the warning go through that perhaps having so many probabilities being close to ones and zeros um, might be problematic somewhere along the way, but that's kind of beyond me at the moment. For this calculation, compared to the 20 seconds that the previous calculation did, this calculation is <laughs> That's why I said on orders of magnitude faster than before. <laughs> so what the probit approximation will do is produce one decision boundary, kind of like the earlier techniques. But one more time, because I ran what's a relatively simple example, it turns out that this decision boundary is very close to the ones that I had produced earlier for logistic regression and robust logistic regression, and thus the, the counts are exactly the same in the classification. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, well, I mean, it's it, yeah. it, it, it's good in a way, though, that the, the different methods 
um, have behave um, comparably on on. I mean, because I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at the data set and think that I I could probably draw a line that's <laughs> separated as well, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, you know, that's cool. That's cool. So the the pro bit is like, um, hold on, what is it now? It's a, a kind of variational base approaches it then if you're if you're making assumptions about what the distribution of the posterior what what form it has is that right and and then kind of um hold on maybe i'm wrong it it, it does seem a lot maybe it's too fast for what i'm thinking it is um cool cool Yes, and um, I think you just um, mentioned this. I now realize that, yes, uh, like we've seen in previous sections, instead of assuming a linear boundary, if we had something um, more parabolic or circular, we could probably find a more interesting decision boundary and see mm, yeah. how the different techniques work with, with that one in mind. Yeah. Cool, cool. To summarize the chapter, we, we are thinking of the just regression for binary classification task. The folks who are looking into robust matters, robust just regression, are uh, have formed ways to help with with classification outliers. Bayesian logistic regression is great when you want to measure uncertainty in your regression coefficients, but with the con that is computationally expensive and then vice versa for the probate approximation computationally inexpensive and but it loses out information on the posterior distribution and that's chapter 10. cool cool thanks yeah it, it is nice to see the the code for these different things um uh put together in r um i know that the um the book does have some examples in it has some example code written in python that that was used to generate the figures but to see the actual kind of working code that you you would actually use in a model is really good um yeah so thanks for that um okay right